So I'm Jun Peng Lao, and I don't speak Spanish, so I have no idea what's happening just now. <laughs> <laughs> so I will just keep talking, and if this session is over, somebody please stop me. All right, so today, I will, first of all, welcome to this session. And um, today I will talk about how to uh, write if effective Bayesian programs using TensorFlow and TensorFlow probability. So first of all, if you have your laptop here, I highly encourage you to follow this um, collapse. So there is, uh, this is a short, short link that you can uh, follow. And uh, it already have the environment set up code block. So you just run the first two blocks. Um, and uh, the, basically what it does here is um, it upgrades um, the TensorFlow to the to nightly build and also TensorFlow probability. And also I will be using Arvis to, to do all the plotting and the diagnostics. So if I would this moment. Right, uh, does everybody get the, the short link? Or this might still need a few minutes. Okay, uh, so while you are setting up the environment, and I hope that it works, uh, <laughs> Uh, a little bit of, about myself. So I'm currently a data scientist in Google, and uh, so I based in Zurich. And um, I I'm not part, officially part of the uh, TensorFlow probability team, although I work very closely with them in terms of like API designs and also how to use it to 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 write programs specifically to do data analysis. So this kind of like um, how you use TensorFlow and TensorFlow probability in your day-to-day -day data science jobs. And um, f first of all, before, before I start, please show uh, a hands if you have ever used uh, any kinds of Bayesian um, programs. For example, if you have used uh, Python, PyMC3, or you have used um, a, a stance from R. Uh, yeah, please uh, show up hands. Right, thank you. And how many of you have kind of some basic knowledge of what, um, what Bayesian programming is trying to do, or probabilistic programming in general? OK, great. Um, so it, for those of you uh, have never uh, used to have never do Bayesian statistic before, or you have never kind of write any, or you know the basics, but you never actually write down a model, uh, don't be afraid. Um, I, it, it, especially in the beginning, you might feel like this tutorial is kind of like just threw you in the deep end of the water. I ask you to take kind of uh, a leap of faith and just try to follow the code and try to run the, the, the code because I guess everybody here knows Python and you find that it's actually, uh, you, you get intuitions from running the code and try to mess it around and debug it much better than just read the book and try to learn Bayesian statistics. Right, okay, so. Um, in terms of like doing Bayesian statistics, the key here is we want to follow this kind of box loop. So basically the idea is that you first gather some data from some real world, real world uh, phenomenons and then you cycle through this box loop. Uh, basically, you try to build a probabilistic model, and then you, you feed the data to the probabilistic models, and then you do criticism. So for example, is the, the parameter uh, uh, fitted, does it make sense? Is, the, is, is it makes good posterior uh, predictions? Is it, um, is it um, gives the, uh, uh, the sample is actually high quality? and is the model actually capture all the information you have and is a kind of like real, a realistic representation of your current knowledge. And as a kind of like a more advanced version is this kind of uh, modern Bayesian workflow and it's, um, it's kind of like an extension of the box loop. So now that the key part here is that um, you would have this workflow not just, it, it, it's not only helping you to, to build a model, but it also helps you to know that whether you are incorporating the prior information correctly into it. 
So if you look at this kind of like larger flow charge, uh, you will find that um, kind of some of the key component in, in terms of what a probabilistic model should give you is that you should be able to simulate fake data and you should, be, you should have a um, kind of coherent workflow that you can inference the model. And then once you think that the model is good, then you can use the inference result. Usually I prefer to use the MCMC sample and then um, as a representation of the, the model and the inference that I have, and then I plug it in into, uh, for example, some objective function to help me to make actual decisions. So the aim of today is I want to show you how to write this effective probabilistic model in TensorFlow probability. And the kind of the key point here is uh, you need to think in terms of batch. So batch in this case is that uh, you have some kind of program and you want to run it in parallel across um, a, a lot of kind of copy of itself. And each of them has a little bit different state, but they are all the, represent, all the same representation of the problem that you set up. For example, one of the um, uh, kind of classical uh, example in this case would be you run in a, um, a uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain, and then you have multiple chain. So each chain, uh, for example, if you run 10, 10 ch chains, and each of them would be one batch. And the second point is uh, if you want to have like a fast uh, TensorFlow program, usually we want to make sure that it's, it compiled to SLA, is um, kind of this linear algebra uh, accelerations, a special compiler that is designed initially for TPU, but it actually keeps a great speed up also for GPU. And if you, if you are able to make your program that compiled to SLA, it will mean that once, uh, when you want to run it on GPU or when you want to run it on TPU, they, they will be all be compatible and you will have no problem across hardware and it gives you like great speed up. Uh, actually before, uh, in the beginning when I was uh, preparing for this talk, SLA was much more difficult to use and now um, you can just do in your uh, TF doc punch, uh, function wrapper, you can just put this experimental compile as true and then it will automatically compile to SLA. So basically I almost cut all the tutorial half because <laughs> uh, now it's just so much easier to use. And this tutorial is largely based on modeling with joint distribution. So today we will use mostly the uh, TF uh, tensor probability doc distribution, doc joint, uh, joint distribution as a main API that we will be interacting uh, and writing uh, programs. Right, so first of all, a small primer of using linear regression. So a linear regression uh, problem that uh, we all love and know uh, is that in the most simplistic one, we have um, kind of three, two parameters, if you are thinking in a more frequency statistic uh, sense. Uh, you have the intercept and the uh, coefficients. So in uh, NumPy or SciPy, you can generate a fake data set like this. So you have the uh, 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 covariate or the predictors, and you would have the parameters here, and then you can just do this, uh, simulate one data set. And usually you see notation something like this, and basically this means that your observed data is some kind of linear predictions plus some noise. And then in the classical kind of, uh, if you're doing um, frequency statistics, then you will have an estimator, in this case, a least, uh, least square estimator by doing some projection of your data to this, the, um, um, this kind of space that's set up by, the, by your design matrix. And you can easily write it into, uh, well, easily, uh, if you know, <laughs> um, you, you can uh, kind of rethink it um, in a different ways of like more a generative model uh, kind of thinking, which means that all the three parameters we have, we now think of it as um, generated from some, from some prior distributions. 
So again, here I ask you to take a bit leap of faith. Just look at this prior as some arbitrary prior that you set up. So in reality, when you're actually doing practical Bayesian statistics, choosing a correct or well choosing a prior that reflect your prior knowledge correctly takes uh, basically takes practice and you you know better since you go along. But in the beginning, just take a leap of faith and just assign it with some arbitrary priors. And once you set, assign arbitrary priors to it, then you can generate data because all the kind of this um, distribution, it all comes with a random number generator and then you can gener uh, generate data from it. And you will just plug in the information you know, in this case is the predictors. And you can have your um, observed, uh, the, the distribution for the, for, the, uh, for, the, for your actual observed. Usually people call this as a likelihood. And this is the, the kind of like the whole model you have. So in a kind of like a vanilla way of writing a TensorFlow um, program, you will basically need to write um, this model two times. Once in uh, this kind of forward random, uh, if you want to generate data, and once in this kind of reverse um, to generate a log likelihood function when you try to do inference. So to write a forward random uh, generations, you do something similar to this. So you might recognize some of the um, um, uh, kind of like more standard uh, uh, things, which is something like a TFD dot normal, which it sets up the, the distribution. So I would quickly go back a little bit to show you that the, the import here. So first of all, I would import the TensorFlow and TensorFlow probability. This is a really kind of um, good thing to, to use because if you import the uh, compact.v2 as TensorFlow, I think most of the new release of TensorFlow, this will put you into the TensorFlow 2.0 API, which means that once that becomes uh, the, the mainstream, you can just remove the, um, um, you, you can just change, uh, change it into ten, in, import TensorFlow as TF, and your code will work uh, continuously for quite a, quite a bit of time. And also two important things I, I said, set it TFD equal to TensorFlow probability doc distributions. So now it contains the, uh, the module of distributions. And also I have the TFP doc bijectors. So these concepts, uh, you might be familiar with distributions, um, but bijectors, it might sound a little, little bit of like a, a foreign concepts. So uh, the bijectors are a, a module of uh, transformations that preserves volumes. And uh, again, I'll ask you to take a little bit uh, leap of faith when we come across it. For now, let's just stick with the distributions. And um, you can see that uh, what it has. Apologize, I'm not using my own computer, so live coding is, uh, is quite a risk here. <laughs> so it explains to you a little bit of uh, what it has actually has. Yes. Um, look at normal, maybe this would be, give us a little bit more information. Right, so basically it has um, some parametrizations and it has a validate uh, uh, underscore arguments. It's uh, a good practice to send it to true, especially when you are setting up like more complicated uh, distributions. And then you also can s assign a name. Uh, so th the name is just for, uh, for this node to appear in a TensorFlow graph and is useful when you are doing debugging of your models or TensorFlow programs in general. And you can see all the information from here. Um, it has, um, oh, actually, sorry. It has a, a, a kind of, um, 
a lot of different properties. Probably easier if I... So it contains useful um, property. The most, the most we'll be using is stock sample because this gives, gives us um, a random sample or random realization from the distributions. For example, um, you will see something like this. Basically, it's a five, five, you can think of it as five random draw from these distributions. So when it, when it comes to distribution, it has this big concept of shape. So here, I would, uh, I would kind of like touch it a little bit, but uh, kind of like more formal um, um, introduction, you also need to do some readings afterward because it's a concept that um, is, at times it could be quite confusing. And one of the signature of the distribution is that when you do samples, and then you can always plug it back in into the log plot. So if you are uh, implementing um, a distribution on your own, a very good way to check that whether it works is that you plug it strictly back in into the log block and, and basically check, make sure at least the shape is correct. Right, so now after this small um, side notes on, on distribution, we can go back to our program of doing, just to try to set up this forward kind of like random generations. So you do samples. Here I pass it an argument of a uh, number of re replicas. So basically it means that how many samples I want to generate from these distributions. And the first three lines in a way is directly respond, correspondent to the priors because this, you don't need any dependence in a way. So once you set up the distribution, it's, um, it's there, it's a, it's a very concrete kind of um, object and you just do sample from, from it. And then you will plug it in into um, a linear functions. And here, um, I, I need to do some juggling of the shape because otherwise uh, it doesn't give me the correct uh, result. And also for the, for the last uh, one, when I set up the light liquid. And here, one of the things that you might notice is that and I will only do sample once here. The reason being that um, there's some broadcasting happening here because the X here now is uh, the number of observation we have. Um, and if we have the number of replica, basically we want to broadcast it into uh, the shape of the your number of observation and the replica you have. So that's kind of like the first a uh, point of like a batch thinking because um, alternatively what we can do is we don't put this argument and just draw once and the program will work and you don't, kind of, you, you don't need to kind of worry about the, the shapes but, the, the, um, but then if you want to repeatedly generate, uh, do these forward generations, uh, you might need to write into a for loop. Of course, there's other ways to do it because this is an embarrassingly uh, parallelized program so you might be able to use a path four, uh, and it's also a valid thing to do. But in general, if you think ahead of like, oh, what is the batch should be, or, and what the shape should be in this case, you would generally take the full advantage of a TensorFlow probability uh, programs. Now, so uh, after I set up these functions, I can do a forward generation of just draw nine, um, kind of a random example from it, and I can plot it. So this would be uh, my prior predicted uh, distribution or uh, some prior predicted uh, samples to tell you what my probabilistic program looks like if I draw a sample from it. And then so that, that is for, it's kind of like the first part of uh, what, what you would be expecting from a probabilistic program is that it can draw a random sample or it can generate uh, random uh, observations. And then it's the part of uh, you actually setting up the, 
a, a log likelihood function, which you, you would use it for doing inference. So in this case, the first three is, it, it looks uh, really similar to what you, you are writing in the forward um, sampling program. The difference is, is that now you actually pass in the unknowns that you have for this model, and then you will evaluate the log proc and then again, the linear function is actually the same because they are all tensor, so you also need to make sure that the broadcasting is happening correctly. And last, uh, you, you set up the likelihood in a really similar way, but instead of sample, you evaluate the log procs on your observations. And it's probably a better practice also is to, is to put the, the log procs, uh, all your observation here, and um, and when you are actually doing inference, you make it into a closure so that it doesn't require the, um, the, your observations all the time. It don't, doesn't require you to surprise ob observation all the time. And if you look at the return here, something you might notice that is um, I need to do a reduced sum because otherwise it wouldn't give me the correct result. The reason being that if you just execute this, the, uh, the likelihood naively, you get the, 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 their shape would be different. So by what, what I meant is that what you can try is to common out this and get this into, just output all the, the log proc. So each part of the log proc. And I also remove the reduced sum at the end. No, actually, I'm common this. Actually, I would just print the shape so because that's what we would be. We want to know. Um, Okay, so now you see that because before, recall that we are drawing nice samples from it. And now when you, once you evaluate it, you find that the last one has a different shape than the others. And the, um, kind of like the best case scenario, uh, if you do it this way and do, just do the sum, is that it will throw you an error because it tells you, oh, I cannot broadcast this. But a worst case is that actually you might have some scalar somewhere and it got broadcast to, the, uh, to your log proc and you give you an incorrect result. And um, so that's kind of like the first check you, you should do when you're writing this vanilla kind of uh, log proc functions. And, and another thing that is the, the good thing of writing it in, in a batch, I would um, go back. Is that now you can evaluate on a really large arrays, and then it's you can actually do this kind of grid search, like really stupidly, especially when you are in a low dimension space, and it's a great way to visualize your probabilistic programs. For example, what I'm doing here is that I set up a grid of uh, what, one of the, the two of the, run, uh, the parameters that I'm interested in, and I fix the kind of the uh, error or the epsilon into one, and I give it a range of, oh, actually I think the betas will be in this range and the uh, intercept will be in this range, and then I flatten it and uh, evaluate on the log procs, as you can see here, and it will give you, uh, and then after res reshape it into a square, and it will give you this kind of like the landscape or the geometry of the log likelihood functions. And in general, uh, I find it is a really good way to check, uh, especially when you have problem of doing samplings, it's a really good way to check whether the space actually looks kind of um, okay. Because if you have multi, multi, multiple mode in your posterior space, it's always very difficult to sample. 
So, right, so that's kind of like a really quick primer of how you would write down a probabilistic program in TensorFlow using this really low level API. So basically you write your lock, uh, lock clock functions and you write your forward generated functions. And it's, it's, um, if, you, if you kind of like know everything that you want to do, you have like controls to the last detail but at the same time, it's really tedious, and sometimes if you write, if you make a mistake in one of the functions, then it's, uh, it, it might be, it, it might get quite difficult to debug. So now let's move on to, to, um, to, to also a linear regression example, but now we're using the API from the joint distributions. So I'm using a data set from one of the PIMC uh, uh, documentary. So you can uh, look at the, you can follow the link afterward to get, basically get some background information from it. But basically the, op the data we, are, we, are, we have, it looks like this. And you can see there's some outliers here. And um, in this data set, uh, each of the observation, it comes with its own error. So, um, in, we will only be setting up a model that we're interested in two parameters, the uh, intercept of the linear regression and the coefficient of the linear regression. So now, if you are writing it down in the joint distributions, I, the, the, the favorite API I will use is the sequential. Here, basically, you pass a list of either a, a list uh, of either distribution or a lambda function um, to the initialization of this class. And you can look, let, let's look at it line by line of the signature of how you would write down a probabilistic program. So you have the prior, here B0 is the intercept and B1 is the coefficients. And then you write down these lambda functions that basically declare what is the dependency of the inputs and how you would use this de dependency to return a distribution. So for example, here, B0 is the intercept and B1 is the coefficient. And a, kind of like a small, um, really important detail is that you always need to pass it as the order uh, closest. So the first argument is that it needs to be the distribution closest to the ones that you're writing right now. So for example, you have uh, B0, B1, and here, because the B1, uh, because the, the next one is uh, directly after the B, uh, uh, B1, so you need to put this as the first argument. And if you have something like, for example, you have other, other distribution here, for example, say that we actually also want to model the sigma, and we give it some other, uh, some prior distributions of um, something like this. For the program to work correctly, you actually don't need to put the last one here. But imagine now that if you have this being in the middle of the two parameters, So now imagine that this uh, prior distribution is actually in the middle. You, what you can do is you can put this um, underscore, so just to declare that you're, you don't need in this argument. But it's, it does no harm to also put this in as well. Of course, uh, if you put this in, then in inference, you also need to modify the, the list of uh, inputs you actually goes into your log clock functions. So now we can run this program. And first thing we, we will do is to check the graph of the model to see the dependencies. So for example, if you do it this way of resolving the under, uh, underlying graph, it will show you that we have uh, two prior distribution that it does not depend in, or it does not have any dependencies. And then we have the likelihood that is parameterized by the, um, uh, the, the two par uh, three parameters. And X here is the last node. It's kind of like um, 
currently you cannot change the name, but if you use other uh, joint dis distribution API, you can change the name here. And now you can, we can also do sample from it. And this is what it looks like uh, when we do one samples. So here it gives a list of uh, tensors. I've made a mistake here, it's not too close. And you can also plug it in directly into the log clock function to compute uh, the log clock. And if we do so, we actually see that the, um, uh, the shape is wrong here. It's wrong because we are only sampling it once, so which means that we should be getting back the log clock also being a scalar. So here is kind of like the first concept of a batch is that because uh, when you do samples, um, in, in this context at least, is a batch of random samples and we should expect it to always return this, uh, the same shape when we do the dot log plot. So here is that um, you can, we can further check that where it's going wrong by do, calling the dot, uh, log plot dot, uh, underscore pass which uh, return each pack of the log clock functions that in this probabilistic models. And we can see that maybe uh, not super obvious, but uh, the last one, because we have some multiplications uh, in, the, in there where we set up the linear predictions. Now that the shape is incorrect, because we actually want to do a reduce sum at the last, uh, for, the, for the last random variables. So the trick here to make this uh, works is to use uh, something called tfd.independent, which it uh, reinterpret what's the batch shape. And in another word is that it's, it's basically tells you, uh, you tell the program uh, where in which, in which dimension we should do further reduce uh, sum to make sure that um, uh, the output is correct. And in the beginning, it might take some try and error, but um, probably, at, at least for me, uh, to, to figure this out, like kind of like a really quick way is just to try different read, read interpret, interpret batch dimensions to, to make sure that uh, when you actually call, um, now that if you do, um, dot sample of um, some batch and then do and then evaluate the log clock it should give you the same uh, shape Let's move on from this one now. Oh, actually, we can try to see that what's still happening here. Right, so this doesn't work right now because uh, we are doing the multiplications and uh, here, what's happening is that this is a scalar, so when it do the broadcast under, under, underneath uh, to, do the, to get the linear predictions is, is, is incompatible, so it's, which is what it's trying to tell, tell us here. And in general, in the, uh, at least from the beginning to kind of like quickly fix this, is that we arbitrarily expand the, the dimension here. So for example, because we are drawing five draws from here, and uh, the key is to make this work because now this one, it has a shape of 20, and this one have the shape of uh, five, or, or, or any of the batch shapes you are, you are trying to, um, you're trying to draw. So which means that B1s, it has the shape of uh, basically just a batch shape. 
And as for X, we have a, a different shape, which is the what's inherent from the um, uh, from this, the problem setups that we have. So, which is the number of observations. And what we want after um, what we want from the um, at least to, for the um, uh, linear predictors to work or the linear function to work is that we want to get the shape and the number of observations. So, which means in this case, to make it work, we can arbitrarily uh, expand this into, for example, if you make this into shape of uh, batch shape one, oops, and make this into one and number of observations, then it will get broadcast correctly. So I, you can try it uh, yourself. Um, and that's kind of like the, the way of debugging a model when you have an incompatible shape in, in the middle of your models. And of course, for B0, you also would need to expand the shape, also likely for the sigmas, because uh, otherwise you always complain that um, it cannot set this up correctly. And a better style to write this is to, you have a generate, um, uh, you have a function to generate a model so that um, uh, you would, you, you can change, for example, hyper, um, the, have some hyper parameters much easier and you can do other setups uh, a bit easier as well. And here it's not going to work as well because um, uh, because we also have incompatible shape. And I, I will come to let me see if I have the here of fixing it. Actually, no. Um, so uh, I, I will I will have to uh, correctly write in about shapes later. So here. Uh, because we don't have the, we don't do the broadcasting correctly, so this will still give you an error if you want to, to do kind of draw a batch from it. So right now, we are still dealing with a, a probabilistic model that is not batch compatible. But we can already use this program um, to do inference. So one of the APIs that we can use is, um, I will skip this part. So this is just a FYI that there's other ways to, to there's other kind of joint distribution that you can use. Um, but I will quickly skip this for now and show you how you can use this, uh, the model to do, for example, inference. Um, so uh, TensorFlow probability comes with the optimizer. One of it is the really famous LBFTS. And you can do this kind of maximum likelihood estimation or mass maximum uh, posterior estimations. So what you do is that you first set up the uh, negative log likelihood functions. Now uh, we, we need to first generate a closure, which means that because the observation is kind of like fixed. So um, we would just have the three parameters comes from the input. And I think right now it's still the case that the optimizer it needs to take um, um, basically one TensorFlow um, a, a tensor as um, as the input to the function. So you would also do some shape uh, or slice the inputs uh, shenanigan here. And to call the APIs, you you just do, you just pass the log likelihood. Here, the, uh, the, I do it is as a negative log likelihood because he's trying to find a maximum. Uh, so I do the um, a negative here. And also I need to wrap it uh, in a tfp.math value and gradient uh, wrapper. This will actually generate not just the, the kind of the loss function, 
but also the gradient uh, re with respect to the inputs. So now uh, if you run this, it, the result is in precision, and then you, do, you can do, uh, convert it to NumPy, and this uh, we can prop what is the, uh, the fit of the model. So this is how it looks like, and of course, because we have outlier here, and with a Gaussian likelihood, it will just have this kind of like bias curve, uh, a fitted model. And now that, uh, re remember that before, oh, actually here there has one. To have like a batch uh, uh, version work, we need to do this uh, kind of shape expansion to make sure that um, the shape is correct. So, uh, because that uh, we want to want it to be broadcast correctly, so we always need to kind of like part the, the dimension of those that is incompatible, and do this book bookkeeping on a piece of paper or in your head, and to make sure that uh, you you get back a a, poke, um, a joint distribution that it can actually sample a batch from it. So now this one would work as a batch version. And we can also check it from, by doing this uh, sample distribution. So it not only comes back with um, the samples, it also comes back with the distribution, which you can further check what the shape is. I will skip this uh, part for now because uh, if we go into detail of shapes, um, it's going to take us a, a whole day. Um, but at least like intuitively, how you would check this kind of program is always do samples and then you evaluate a log plot. And if this pass, uh, you would have, you basically means that you have a correct program set up. So in this case, you can see that all of the random variables, it has the correct shape. And when you do the sum, uh, it, they will be also broadcast correctly. And again, here, uh, I wrap into a function but here I also do a little bit different tricks here. Because remember that in this case, we always kind of like, oh, we need to think about how the broadcasting works because otherwise it's not going to do the reduce sum correctly. And also when you plug it in into a linear function, it will give you a lot of trouble, complaining. So one way to kind of uh, um, go around it is use this called TFD samples. It's in general a great way when you have um, some distribution, but it's in, in this kind of repeat measurements uh, sense. So in one of the example would be you are testing, um, you, you're doing a, a mixed effect model and you have, um, for example, you're doing uh, some kind of survey and you have number of uh, people response and you have some common parameters and you want to broadcast it into all the, um, the response that you have. And using dog samples basically gives you the, you always give you the correct um, reduced sum when you comp compute the log likelihood. And a nice case in this case uh, is that now this instead of being a scalar uh, distribution is actually with uh, is a, um, a shape one a vector, and then it will do the broadcasting correctly, and also uh, you don't need to do this parting of the uh, of your um, uh, parameters. Of course, you still need to do some shape padding on the input because they still have the wrong shape. But at least now, uh, this will work kind of um, more naturally. So this is kind of like the first, um, I would say, a tip is that when you have scalar functions or scalar distribution, and you want to make it into something that is easier to work with in a batch, is that you just sample one. Semantic, uh, uh, in terms of like what the distribution is, is almost identical. It's just the output shape is now different. And some small side note here is that um, sometimes we might not be able to always uh, write a function that is kind of like this batch version. For example, some of the ODE models is only defined, it's really difficult to take, make it into a batch. And there are also like helper function to do that. For example, you can do this tf uh, dot vectorize map. That's a, that should be always the first thing you try because it um, is the fastest way to vectorize the, your function. And if that doesn't work, for example, you have some dynamic shape somewhere, 
And you can use this map uh, underscore fn. And it also does similar thing, but it's kind of like have a higher tolerance rate of your TensorFlow uh, function. But uh, the cause of, of course is that it runs a quite, quite a lot slower as well. And here it's just like uh, I wrote this small helper function to validate the, the log proc to make sure that the shape is always the same as the previous one. But I think that if you put down validate uh, argument as true, in setting up your distribution is to do something very similar. Right, now that since we have this kind of batch version of um, um, uh, models, and we can have a batch version of log proc functions, it's much easier to do uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo because all the APIs in TensorFlow probability in the uh, MCMC module is that they always have have this capacity that you can pass in a batch version of log proc. And one of the kind of the key thing of a uh, uh, change of thinking is that, uh, for example, when I'm, I'm writing um, a PyMC3 models, usually the number of chains that I can sample efficiently is bounded by the number of CPU I have. Because that's basically how it works that uh, in PyMC3, we compile the log proc functions, we compile the sampling uh, kind of um, a pipeline, and then we just pickle it and send it to different CPUs. Uh, similar conceptually also for STAN is that uh, it needs the number of cores to do an independent, independent chain, otherwise it would just sample it uh, sequentially. And that's a big difference uh, when we look at TensorFlow programs because um, the batch is kind of like a really, kind of like the first class citizen in a sense that is highly optimized so that even when you just have one CPU or one GPU, it can run a batch version much quicker. And sometimes you can run tens of thousands of batch uh, in a course of similar to just running five batch. So whenever possible, always try to set the number of chains much larger here, I only set it to 10, but it's e you can easily set it to 100, and it will should still sample quite quickly. And I also write these helper functions to, to do samplings from uh, the NAS samplers. And right now, there's a lot of boilerplate code because uh, we are still, um, in a way, that TensorFlow probability is a really low level library, so that it gives you all the um, the, the things that you, you, you can do, kind of lots of possibility, but also it doesn't have that much of high level API yet. Um, so if I want to use the samplings, one of the signature is that you would always pass in, a, 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 you always need a log proc functions, and you will also need some additional arguments that is related to the sampler that you are using. So here I'll be using the no, uh, no U-turn samplers. And what it needs is that it needs the step size and it, you need to specify the target log proc functions. Uh, so I will do this setup kind of like outside of the, the run chain functions by first uh, doing the sample. So this would be my initial state. And the step size, I just do it uh, aside in an arbitrary point one. And it's, we will do some step size adaptations in the middle of the program. So uh, it would kind of choose the step size uh, more smartly. But um, there's still some kind of like, there's a quite a lot of um, um, try and error when you're trying to get the correct step size in, in a ways that it has the right scale. Um, I, I will come to, uh, if we have time, we will uh, go through like, how to do these adaptations much better, similar to what PyMC3 or Stan is doing later on. And then we'll set up a log proc function, which uh, now we are using the log proc from the model, but of course, because we have some absurd data. So we need to generate this closure of lambda function so that is now condition of on the observed data that we have. And I also give it a, a bijector here. I will skip 
here for now because I'm just using an uh, identity uh, bijector. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is because later on we will have an example that actually use, uh, we need uh, a bijector that is actually transfer, uh, kind of like mapping the parameter, parameter into a continuous space. But right now, you just look, we just look at it as one argument we can pass in, uh, into this uh, function that we do uh, sampling. And here is kind of like the magic that makes sure to, to make the program run fast is you wrap everything into a TF doc function. Now that it will compile graph, and because I have experimental compiles true, it will also compile the SLA. I usually will put the auto graph equal false in the, uh, in, in the in, uh, as a, a kind of like a default because in TensorFlow probability, we have a lot of places that we have a for loop, but it's running kind of like iterated through a static input. And if you have auto graph as true, it will try to also um, automatically convert those into um, into the graph, which I actually don't want here. So that's why I always put auto graph equal false. But the consequence uh, of doing this is that if your program actually has a for loop and you want to make it into like a fast, faster version with the auto graph, that is not going to work and it actually would generate a huge graph. So in general, the, my recommendation or I think the best practice is that if possible, you should always write, uh, remove all your for loops unless you're sure that that's needed. So if you have a for loop that's actually doing computation, you should always try to rewrite it into a tf dot y loops. Or if you need each, uh, each step of the, y, uh, of the for loop, then you will write it into tf dot scan. Uh, okay, so here there's a lot of calls, so I will not go through everything. Um, one of the things that I'm not going into too much detail is the setting up of this dual origin step size adaptation. So for now, just think of it as some things that uh, you will always do uh, to try to kind of improve the efficiency of the sampler. And this is, uh, however, this is actually uh, important is having a trace function. So a trace function is that not only that you are getting the samples, but we are, you are also getting this kind of metadata from the sample. For example, here I will get in the target log block, which basically means that each sample evaluate on the log block what is the outcome on each step. Number of leaf frogs that be uh, taken, that is uh, just kind of like useful things to know uh, for nuts, uh, a, a no utent sampler to to know that how efficient your program is and how you can improve. And whether it has divergence, that's of, uh, um, an energy, that's also a concept that is uh, highly related to nut sampler. So if you are not familiar with these concepts, take a leap of faith, let's uh, move on from here for now. And the function signature for doing samples is that you pass in the kernels so before here, I, it's all for setting up a transitional kernels. Um, and you will have the number of steps, which this is the actual number of uh, MCMC samples you will get. And you will have the burning, which is uh, tightly related to step size adaptations. And other things you need is you always need to pass the initial state, which uh, you tell the program uh, where the Marco chain Monte Carlo to start in the posterior distributions or the space that is set up by the uh, posterior. And the trace function, which is the kind of like this metadata you want to keep track from the transitional kernels. And now that we have this function set up, we can do sample from it. And here, um, I'm just setting the initial state, the step size, and the target log blocks. And here, um, you, you can re uh, disregard this for now. And I'll be using Aris as to, to display the result. So here, there is uh, also, again, some boilerplate code to, um, to name the, the results correctly. So when it translates into Aris um, trace or uh, uh, Aris uh, data, 
it has the correct labels and the correct kind of uh, dimensions for the for what is the chain and what is the, the draws. And we can take full advantage of it to, do, um, uh, to display the result. For example, we can do trace procs, we can do forest proc, look at the energy proc, uh, or whatnot. And we can also look at, kind of reconstruct the um, uh, prediction function at, in a spirit that's similar to what a, a posterior a predicted sample would do. Now let's change gear a little bit, still with our example, but now we actually want a robust uh, linear regression. So we put it as a, a student T model. The difference is here is that we changed um, uh, the likelihood because the likelihood of a normal likelihood, it doesn't take into account of this outlier really uh, in a good ways. So by using a, a slightly more heavy tail distribution, now that all the we kind of like more tolerate that we might have some observations that it just uh, doesn't look like the others. So in a way, it's kind of like outlier. So uh, the first few parts, it still looks very really similar to what we have previously. So it's the co two coefficients. And for the degrees of freedoms, because for um, um, the student T distribution, we need to specify the degree, degrees of freedom. We just give it a, a prior as a, a uniform within some range. It's a, it's a pretty poorly chosen um, a prior, um, but it will work for now. And also, I do the sample dot size one so that um, I don't need to do kind of lock of shape jugglings in setting up the, the distribution later on. And very similarly, uh, it gives you, we can check the graph and make sure that, oh, actually it has the right dependency. And also here, you can observe that because we have the degrees of freedom as being the last distribution that we specify, it comes with the first argument, and then the B1, and then the B0. And we can validate that this is correct. And we can do samples. And this is uh, prior predicted samples of, um, of what the kind of the outcome will look like. And again, we can do a maximum likelihood. Um, but here, we, because the, um, uh, the optimizer will assume that all your parameters is live in this continuous um, space. So you actually need to to do the com uh, transformation so that it's, um, it, it, it satisfies the, the, re the API requirement. So I'm using the interval transformations. Uh, I was, um, this is a kind of like a basic setup of how you would uh, write a bijector, but I would skip through this part for now. And just to show you that this will also give you um, uh, maximum likelihood estimations. And now that the bijector is actually important when we are calling the samplers, because what the sampler, the nut sampler or HMC, uh, 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 Hamiltonian, Monte Carlo in general, it also requires you, at least in most cases, for the program to work correctly, is that all the free parameters it should be on this continuous uh, real light. Uh, so the, um, the API to do this is that we use this called um, a tran transfer um, a transitional kernel, which um, I'll go back, which is that you pass um, an unconstrained bijector here, and it will it will convert the log clock function internally into a function that leaves uh, basically um, is unconstrained all the parameters. And it, because it does the bookkeeping internally, for example, make sure that the Jacobian is correct and also make sure the transformation is correct, the output sample is always kind of um, in, in the correct range. So the untransformed parameters is never directly exposed. 
Right, so this is uh, quite similar to what we would do for the, um, um, as the um, a sample for the, for the other models. And while this runs, um, I will skip to the next example of this finish. Oh, this one is actually running a bit slow. Um, okay. So if you, uh, once you kind of like get more into Bayesian modeling, and you'll find that you can always, um, there's lots of diagnostic, diagnostics comes with Arvis, and is a really state of the art because um, um, the developers are actively implementing new diagnostics and also um, keep up to date with kind of like the, what's the best practice. So for, for those parts, uh, please refer to the, to the Arvis kind of libraries. And I'm not sure how much time I have, but, um, oh, okay. So I, I keep going. So here is an, another example. Um, is, uh, is from the baseball data of 18 players from Alfron. And basically it's kind of like, um, we want to infer the ability of each uh, a baseball player. And here, the, the model setup, um, you can look at the, the Pime C3 docs to see that why we are setting up a distribution like this. But here's just basically just a taste of uh, what you would do. And there's, uh, I don't think there's much of the things that we haven't uh, seen today. But some things that I want to uh, point out before uh, we wrap up this session is that before we are using the API of the, the optimizer, just input a kind of like a scalar function, right? So we basically get our, the output as um, just one um, uh, uh, fit. But actually, the, um, uh, the API itself is also batch, which means that if you want to run this um, uh, optimization like a hundred of times, you can just do one pass to the functions. So what I mean is that uh, when you set up the log proc function correctly as a batch version, for example, here, and uh, you, you do need to squeeze it um, to make, there's yeah, some shape handling again. Uh, but the, kind of the trick here is that now that it actually runs in batch as well. So you can do this kind of like uh, dog optimizer converge any, which means that if any times that um, optimizer say things that is converge, you can output the result. And you can even do converge dog all to force that um, the optimizer finish uh, or terminate only when it, all the result converge. And in this way, it's basically it's a great way to check that if you have different initialization of the, of the optimizer, whether they all converge to the same result. And uh, it, can, it, it, can always be the, it can also be the case that if you have multiple starting points from the posterior space, which one kind of like gives you a, a converge the fastest and you can get the result much quicker. And However, in this case is that uh, the log proc, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, because the posterior space is actually quite difficult to do optimization. So you would actually not have any convergence. And if you kind of plot out if it's converged or if it's fail, everything is fail. Uh, but if you have like other programs that uh, you actually want to look at to find the maximum likelihood or to just find um, some loss function, you want to find the maximums. This is in general quite good ways to, to do this batch uh, kind of um, um, optimizations. Right, so this does not converge, so I will actually do samplings from here. 
and I will skip through these examples. So, but please, um, if you want to kind of like see how uh, each, each of them works, um, uh, please play around with it um, after the uh, sessions. Um, And then here is another example. Uh, I personally find it quite important because a mixture kind of distribution is always kind of a, a quite difficult things to set up. I always like to think that when you have a mixture models, it's kind of like the alternate challenge for any probabilistic uh, program libraries because the broadcasting here is exceptionally tricky. So here I have some hypothetical scenario is that I have, um, basically ask multiple reviewers to label some items, and we have some unknown uh, but two latent labels. So in a way, this is kind of like a, quite a, a beta uh, Bernoulli mixture model, right? And here is the kind of like the problem setup. So I have five reviewers. I have the true fraction of like bad events or labels that, um, or positive labels, or you can think of it. And I have the number of uh, examples that actually being reviewed. And after some parameter transformation, I can uh, draw kind of like generate a random uh, uh, fake data of what the um, uh, observation will looks like. And here, this is some signature of how you set up a mixture uh, distributions in TensorFlow probability. So uh, we need the mixture weight, but you always need to pass it as a categorical. And we need all the components, uh, which is, uh, comes as a list. And here, uh, the important thing is to use the independent here, but I think it probably also work without when you, we are just doing samples. But the log plot will not be correct, most likely. Um, and there are some shake juggling somewhere, uh, but at least for now, um, we don't need to do that because we're just drawing one random sample from it. Kind of. Or a, a, in a way, it's not a batch version of random samples. Now that if you want to move it into, um, uh, into the joint distribution is, um, bit more uh, complicated um, because now we uh, need to make sure that the shape is uh, working correctly. So I think one the, the most differences uh, between the, uh, the ones that you see from above is that you just need to make sure the concatenations is correct in this case. Right, and we can also do the similar things to do draw a sample from it and look at how the, um, uh, the output sample size, uh, output size looks like. And one of the uh, kind of like tricks I, I always use is that because uh, we have our observe and it's just, that is just one instant and we want it to be broadcast correctly into the log prox, basically we want all the batch of the log prox condition correctly on the observations so, and uh, of course, the easiest case we, is we repeat it so that the first dimension is, is the same. But otherwise, we just part the, the, uh, part the shape of the, the input array so that it's, uh, it at least has the same, same rank. And the rest of the, 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 uh, the size of, uh, is still the, um, the same. And now we do the same of checking the, the part, each part of the log prox, and we'll do the inference similarly. Um, right, okay. So last example for the day um, is the kind of mix, uh, the, uh, a mixed effect model from the very famous uh, radon uh, data set. So this is kind of like the models that um, I personally like the most because mixed effect model is uh, surprisingly powerful and it includes most of the use case that I uh, personally encounter. 
Again, uh, I'm not going to detail of how the data set looks like here. You can uh, read it more uh, following the links. And here is just uh, uh, how you will write the models. So um, we will have the, also the priors. And here in this case, um, they don't have any uh, dependency, so these are kind of like straightforward. And we have the um, kind of the, uh, this random effect. And then we also have the fixed effect. And we will at the end have this um, huge functions basically to do this uh, of the linear transformation. And this is usually the things that is, takes the longest time to set up correctly because now that not only we need to make sure the shape is, well, actually 90% of the time is to make sure the shape is, is correct. And uh, so here I actually need to do some transpose. I need to also do some gathers uh, because uh, here the, uh, the county is uh, index uh, kind of vector. And, um, and I also need to reinterpret the batch dimension because um, uh, as, as we um, see in the other example, similarly, uh, we are broadcasting into number of observations so that um, we need to make sure that the reduced sum is computed correctly. Right, and all the rest of the checks is kind of like goes very similar. Uh, and the most important part is again uh, here that you want it to be to the, um, uh, you want the log proc to make sure the log proc is actually compute correctly by checking the, uh, the each part of the, the log proc from your functions. And um, I don't think I will have enough time to to go through all of the rest of the code. But here basically is, uh, is to do this kind of mean view uh, ADVI by using the um, a joint distribution class. Um, So I recommend you to have a look afterwards. Uh, basically, if you are interested in uh, variational inference, uh, the joint distribution is quite uh, a good interface for you to write this um, uh, variational approximations or variational distributions. And the TensorFlow probability team is actively uh, trying to make it uh, even more natural, even easier to, to set up. Um, so you can follow through uh, this afterward. And also uh, just um, at, as um, uh, um, kind of what's difference, what's the differences are in terms of like the MCMC sample here is that um, we, I, I reset the function here because I'm not only that I'm using the, um, uh, doing samplings, I also have a kind of additional, um, um, how is it? additional tuning for the mass matrix. So for example, uh, here is, um, is some code to initialize with the mean, mean field ADVI. And what I was doing is that I first fit the mean field ADVI and I get um, um, kind of get some, and then a, a sample from the variational uh, uh, distributions and I compute the, the standard deviation and use that as the step size. Or alternatively, you can do this uh, mass matrix adaptation, which you, you draw a few samples, and then you compute the mean and the standard deviation of the posterior, and you plug that back in and sample it again. And it's kind of like uh, still in the um, early stage of developing the API, but basically this is, um, kind of how stands or uh, PIMC3 is doing. So as kind of like a more advanced um, uh, uh, um, or practice, if you, you like to call it, is that uh, you can try to re rewrite this into everything in uh, TensorFlow, because now you see that I'm actually using a for loop and repeatedly calling this function. 
but there are ways to, to not materialize all the, the chains and do the computation. And for example, just doing a running means or running co uh, covariance estimations, and then write these whole things into a TFY loop so that we have a coherent API um, to, to do the um, adaptation and the samplings afterward. So uh, yeah, have a look of it afterward and you can, if you are interested, uh, you can try to use it as homework and basically do the rewrite of the um, uh, functions. So, so yeah, that's more or less all of it for, for me today. I didn't go into too much, um, um, too much detail of the last example because there's uh, quite a lot of details and it might be, uh, it, it, might, it, it would definitely uh, take too long to explain everything. But um, uh, yeah, any questions so far? So if you have a follow-up questions, especially in terms of like, oh, I want to implement my own model, but I cannot get the broadcasting right, uh, you can search on the TensorFlow probability. There was a forum that you can post questions. Yes, Arturo? I didn't quite hear you correctly, but uh, if I, it, so you are asking why you would use this API instead of like higher level API. Right, uh, great questions. Uh, I think as a data scientist, uh, of course we use whatever we have that is do our jobs the most efficient, right? Uh, the, I think a good thing of using TensorFlow probability is that uh, it's in the TensorFlow ecosystem, which means that if you want to productionize, productionize this kind of model, it's much easier. And it also comes with uh, good integrations of hardware. So for example, if you want to train on TPU or you want to train efficiently on GPU, it has much more opportunity there. And also I think one of the, uh, it also opened new doors for doing research as well, because now with this kind of uh, batch shape native concept that everything is batch, you can do uh, things that is generally impossible to do currently in any other kinds of framework. Because for example, in a, a PIMC3 or STAN, all the chains you cannot communicate with each other. So for example, if you want to do this replica Monte Carlo, a replica exchange Monte Carlo, which requires you to talk across chain, is only kind of doable uh, in TensorFlow right now. Otherwise you need to roll out your own kind of implementations. ¿Alguna, uy, ¿Alguna otra pregunta? No, están todos muy concentrados. ¿O entendieron todo o no entendieron nada? Cuando hay muchas preguntas. ¿Hay más? Ahí hay una. Buenísimo. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. Uh, so I, I would like to ask, so I, are there some use cases for which you're using this API in Google or is there something in plan or if this API is being used in production to solve some problems? Uh, so, sorry, I didn't quite ca catch it. So my question is basically is this, uh, so what kind of problems or what are some use cases uh -huh. that, uh, I mean, that might be being solved at Google or, or, or you might have solved using uh, Bayesian programs as compared to some alternatives method we have like tree-based models. So uh, I would like to understand on the applied right, side. Right, right. Yeah, great question. I think uh, if you go to YouTube, uh, recently there's a few presentation by the TensorFlow teams, especially by uh, the former TL, Josh. He gave a, a few example of like what is the kind of real life, uh, real life applications that you can do with TensorFlow probability. And I think some of it is uh, really interesting. Um, again, check out the talks. But basically, uh, for example, there was um, 
they have uh, used it to solve, uh, to reduce the fuel uh, efficiency, to improve the fuel efficiency for uh, jet engines. So I think that one of those are, is a really impressive example of how you use it to solve real life questions. Otherwise, in general, I mean, any kinds of uh, Bayesian model that you are running, or even I would claim that statistical models, because as a Bayesian, we always like to think everything is Bayesian. Um, uh, you can do, for example, like A-B testing. And uh, the advantage of using tensor probability is that because it's, um, it takes a advantage of this TensorFlow ecosystem, uh, it means that when you have large data, is it handles it much more gracefully. Instead of like if you are using other frameworks, you might run into problem if you have like millions of data points, tens of millions of uh, users. So um, I think that would be one of the advantage of like why you would want to implement it or look at this lower level of implementations because you have much more control and also um, it comes with the um, um, uh, advantage of being a Bayesian basically so you can incorporate it, your prior information so that's kind of like general advantage of uh, using, using Bayesian statistics. <laughs>